Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you praise and we give you thanks. You deserve all the praises, the glory, and the honor. And Lord, our hearts right now are overwhelmed to spend this whole week with you. Yes, dear Father, this whole week is about you. Not about me, not about us, it's all about you. So dear Father, we ask that you please draw us a little bit closer to you. Each day, Lord, a step closer. And dear Father, I ask as well that you please give us a clearer picture of you. That we'll have this desire to know you. Know you deeper each day. Yes, dear Lord, that is our desire, that you please take us deeper. And Lord, I ask, we ask, dear Father, as a church, that you please prepare our hearts for what you're about to do this week and for what you're about to do tonight. May everything that we do or say will all be for the glory of your name. And Lord, I ask that you please cover me with your blood, cover us with your blood, that I will not be seen nor be heard, and even the desire to be seen or be heard, Lord, please take that away, that Jesus and Jesus alone will be seen, be heard, be lifted up and exalted. And Lord, I ask that you please pour upon us a full measure of your Spirit. For we pray this in the loving name of your Son, Jesus, all your children say, Amen. 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 As, uh, as Brother Jed mentioned a while ago, that uh, he was inspired by the story of, of George Mueller. I was actually inspired as well by the story of George Mueller. When uh, one pastor, a very influential pastor in my life, spoke at our youth congress that we have conducted, he gave this, this story about this guy. And I heard about George Miller, but not really heard about the details of the miracles of his life. And miracles after miracles that I've been hearing somehow awakened that, that desire in me to know more. And one, one specific thing that, uh, that blew my mind is when, remember when George Mueller, oh, by the way, who among you here knows the name George Mueller? Only if, who among you here does not know the name George Mueller? Okay, there are some. Yeah, so George Mueller lived in a time where almost nobody believed that there is a God who hears and answers prayer. So you know what, uh, you know what he did? He lived his life to prove to people that there is a God who hears and answers prayer. So whenever he has a need, he does not come to anyone and ask them to fill that need. He, he will only bend his knees. And when the answer comes, he will know for sure that the answer came from God because he did not ask anyone. That's, that's a very good uh, uh, way to, to really know that God really exists. Huh? So make long story short, oh by the way, just imagine living with, with a family of four is quite a challenge, isn't it? But living with 200 kids, just imagine that. When you hear that, that feeding 200 mouths that's a challenge and not asking for donation not asking for any solicitation that guy is crazy but you know what he challenged God he said Lord feed these kids and every single day the Lord provided for the whole life of his ministry and when he passed away they had a tally of everything that that the Lord has answered to this, uh, to this faithful guy. And the total amounted to 7,250,000 US dollars. Yeah, that's the first word that I uttered, wow. <laughs> and by the way, for those of you who do not know, it happened in the 1800s. That's a bigger wow. Can we say it all together? Wow. wow. <laughs> that's a huge wow there. And you convert the money now, it's 87,500,000 US dollars. And this guy who does not ask around. And back in the Philippines, the way we survive in, in our ministry is just make like a rim of solicitation letter and distribute. And in the end, only a few people gives. <laughs> and we're thinking, this, this has been our way and this is not God's way. And I'm thinking, Lord, if you want me to be a missionary, then 
I have one deal that I'd like to make with you. I will not make any solicitation. I will not even let people know about my need. I will not ask. I will not borrow. I will only ask you. So if you want me to go to mission trips, I'll only ask you. And if you want me to go, then you have to provide. And same is true with George Mueller as well. Uh, by the way, George Mueller refused to receive salary. He refused to receive regular stipend. I said, okay, Lord, this is quite crazy. This is quite scary, but I like to walk in this path. And uh, for some people who will tell me, wow, Jem, uh, your faith is so strong. You, you're, you're such a big man of faith. I said, you just don't know how much my, my knees shake. Every time I, I pray that prayer, it's not that, that we are strong. It's not because that we are strong. We, it's because that we have a strong God. Amen? Amen? We have a powerful God, and most of the time, we just often forget. So what happened was, my first trip was going to India. And I asked the Lord, if you want me to go, then you have to provide. For sure, the Lord provided. The Lord provided me with a ticket. And, and the Lord used one of my stingiest relatives to ask me a question. He said, I heard that you're going to India next week. How much money do you have? And I told my relative, I only have 500 pesos. That is like $10. <laughs> I said, what? How long are you going to stay in India? Uh, like a week. I said, even though it's just a week, you only have like $10. How are you going to survive? And I told him, uh, the Lord will provide. And for sure, the Lord provided through him. <laughs> he was compelled by God. He told me, okay, I will give you 120 US dollars. He gave me 120 US dollars. I said, look for the nearest money transfer and I'll transfer the money to you. I received the money. I went to India and back. And guess what? The $120 was intact. And I said, I like this kind of life, Lord. <laughs> And God is just so amazing that He does not call us to, to make a leap when he, have, when he had not led us in our strides. He'll, God is so patient with us, and I know God was so patient with me because I'm a bit skeptical at first. Sometimes we heard, we heard about uh, mission stories. We hear about miracles that happen, but at the back, of, we praise the Lord. Oh, that's amazing. But at the back of our minds, we always ask this question, did that really happen? Or will that ever happen to me? Oh, that will never happen to me. And that was me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh Lord, that's, that's not real. But somehow the Lord has His ways. He is so patient with us, waiting on us until somehow the time is right or when our back is against the wall, when we don't have any other solution except to cling on Him. Amen? Amen. Difficult situations actually are, are the biggest blessings in our life. Yeah. If not for difficult situations, we would not be compelled to try God. We would not be compelled to somehow, okay, Lord, I've tried, I've tested my way, now it's your way that I want to know. And God always put us in that situation. And this is the story of my life. God has been leading every step of the way, and God is just so good. He always leads me, okay, Jem, a little farther, a little farther, step a little bigger, now jump, now fly. <laughs> God is so good. So <laughs> one, I remember, I remember after that, after the trip in India, how the Lord orchestrated all those things. Uh, my next call was to go to Malaysia. And I began to realize that, Lord, uh, I have to really surrender everything to you. And sometimes when we think we surrender, we say the word surrender, but we don't fully realize what surrender really demands. So our surrender is quite installment basis, isn't it? Huh? But still God is so patient. So I remember the trip in Malaysia. I, was, I came prepared, Pastor Michael. Last time I had like 500, uh, 500 pesos. This time I have 3,000 pesos. That's like $80. <laughs> and I'll be staying in Malaysia for, I'll be staying in Malaysia for uh, one month. India was one week, Malaysia was one month. 
So I was, I was lining up in a migration, uh, uh, in a migration booth, and no, no, in the terminal. And then I begin to discover, oh Lord, we have terminal fee. The terminal fee is 750 pesos during that time. And we have travel tax. The travel tax, tax will cost us 1,620. And I'm thinking, oh go, Lord, there goes my 3,000 pesos. So what's left was like almost 500 pesos again. And during the flight, I remember, Lord, I only have like six sachets of shampoo. For those of you who don't know what sachet is, back in the Philippines, almost everything is in sachet. Like little packets. Have you seen that? Little packets? Because back in the Philippines, almost everything is, is retailed. So most of the people sometimes could not buy the whole pack. When you buy shampoo, they'll buy those little stuff. So everything is in sachet. Shampoo is in sachet. Conditioner is in sachet. Toothpaste is in sachet. Even vinegar, soy sauce is in sachet. Almost everything, even shoe polish is in sachet. <laughs> Seriously. So I, I remember, oh Lord, I only, have, I only have like six sachets of shampoo. You know why it's a big deal for me? Because during that time, every time that it's cold weather, I have this irritating dandruff. And it just comes up every time it's cold. Have you noticed when it's cold? They're like, we want to, to join in the snow as well. <laughs> so they're there. So, and I'm thinking, Lord, what should I do? And this is one thing about, about us as well. I, maybe I'm just speaking, about, uh, speaking for myself. Sometimes we really put God in a box, don't we? God has been taking care of our huge situation. But little stuff like dandruff, we tend to worry. That's how, that's how we look down on God, don't we? And I'm thinking, Lord, how am I going to survive this? And I'm thinking, okay, I know you have taken care of my needs. I know you'll take care of this dandruff situation. I'm thinking, whatever shampoo that my, my nephew will, will be using, that's the shampoo that I will use because I'll be living with my nephew. He's, he's a youth pastor back in Malaysia. The plane touched down. And he was there to welcome me. Lo and behold, he's bald. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why are you bald? <laughs> he's 10 years younger than me. And he told me, I shaved my head off. I said, why? Haircut here is so expensive. <laughs> and I told him, then what are you using for your shampoo? I said, I just use soap. I said, Lord, I cannot use soap. It will irritate my scalp even more. So uh, that thought kept on lingering in my head. And remember, remember, I only have how, how many pesos left back in my pocket again? Like 500. I'll be staying there for a week. And I said, I could not just spend this 500 to buy a bottle of shampoo. I have to surrender this to you. And when we arrived in Malaysia, praise God, it's Chinese New Year. And they spend Chinese New Year not just one day. How many days is Chinese New Year? A week or, or 10 days? It's quite long. And every single night, we go to eat in a different house. Free food. God is good, amen? <laughs> and they have this little envelope that's called Ang Pao. And they give it, in, in that little envelope, there's a little cash there, and they give it to single people. Thank you, Lord, I'm single. <laughs> you have free food, and you have like pocket money. God provides, amen? So I'm, I'm thinking, I should not even worry about those things. And time just went on. Three weeks upon the stay in Malaysia, and I took out my stash of shampoo. And you know what happened? I discovered that I only consumed two sachets of shampoo. I'm thinking, did I take a shower? Yes, I did. You know why? Because the church is situated in a beautiful spot. Stephen, Stephen and I actually, my, my prayer partner Stephen, met at that church. And that church is beautiful. Behind that church is a national park. And you could go around that park. That's like a 2.4 kilometers. 
around that park covered with trees. There's a lagoon in the middle. It's beautiful and there's a lot of, of walk paths. And so every single day we are there mingling with, with, our, with our Bible study interests, with church members. We walk around and we take a shower like twice a day. Because after the jog, you take a shower and before, before the night ends, we have Bible studies. And Malaysia is quite hot. It's like Philippines as well. I'm thinking, Lord, I was taking a shower at least twice a day. And I only consume two sachets for these three weeks. And then it hit me. Wow. Miracles still happen. Amen? Amen. And the first thought that came to my head. Remember Elijah when he went to that widow? And his son and her son and they said that they only have that last last jar last few drops of, of oil in a jar and they will use it and then they'll just wait until they die but the Lord somehow blessed that jar that she shared with the prophet that the jar did not run out that the oil did not run out and I'm thinking it's still happening today and I remember the Israelites who walked around the wilderness for 40 years and the soles of their sandals did not wear off. I'm thinking, wow, Lord, it's happening today. And I'm thinking, why, why is not happening so often? And then somehow the Lord spoke to my heart. It's because my people does not need me as much as those people needed me before. Amen. We put a limit on our God. Sometimes we have our own ways. We have our own ways to, to meet our own needs. So what do we do is that we put God at the last resort. We make our own. And, and I, I remember back home, whenever we needed something, most of the people back home needs money. I guess everybody needs money. When you need money, you always go to the bank, to your relatives, to your friends. And uh, for some of us back in the Philippines, we go to the Indians. The Indians are the ones who lend us money. And when everything else fails, then you remember to run to the Lord. We always put God at the last resort. But then I begin to realize that the more I walk with God, the more the Lord wants me to run to Him first. Just imagine, we always put the best solution at the last, where God wants us to put Him first. That when you run to Him, you run right away, straight to the face of the best solution. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and I remember while I was there in, I was staying in, in Malaysia, and I was somehow blessed as well by, by this beautiful view around me. And for those of you who have known Kota Kinabalu, who among you here knows the place Kota Kinabalu? Only one. Okay. Can you say the word Kota Kinabalu? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a tongue twister, huh? Kota? Kota. Kinabalu. Kinabalu. Kota Kinabalu. Kinabalu. You got it! You're fast learners. Kota Kinabalu has, has this mountain. It's, I guess the third highest in Southeast Asia is called Mount Kota Kinabalu. And this place is really beautiful. Even though I'm not a mountain climber, when I saw the mountain, it just lures you to, to climb him. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, I'm not a mountain I'm, And pe when people ask me, Jem, let's climb some mountain. And I told them, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a mountain climber. And what are you? I'm an Israelite. What do you mean you're an Israelite? I murmur along the way. So, <laughs> I love the beach, but I don't like the mountain because of, of the hike. And, and my, my structure should be a mountain climber. I'm, I'm quite light, but my knees are just like complaining. So somehow a friend of mine asked me, Jem, if you want to go, somebody will sponsor you. So that's good because climbing that mountain is quite expensive. And I was so excited for that, for that climb. And by the way, every single morning, I have my morning devotions. And that place is very conducive for, for morning devotions. And sometimes I will go up to the church. Since we are, we are uh, in that church, I will go up to the church. 
go sit in one of the pews and have my morning devotion. But that particular day, I had my, I had my morning devotion on that bunk because we'll be leaving early. So I set up my laptop. By the way, my laptop has, has all my files. I did not mention that uh, my career before was a photographer. I was a wedding photographer. Always the photographer, never the groom. So <laughs> I, I have all my files in that laptop and it was not backed up. Not backed up. So remember I was in that bunk with my, with my, with my nephew. I was on the, on the top bunk because I'm the lighter one. So when I opened my laptop, it's 4 a.m. I was sleepy and I guess my fingers were quite sleepy. The laptop slipped through my fingers. And by the way, it's not padded floors. It's tile floors. Cement. When that laptop hit the floor, it's like my world shattered. And all I could do was like scream the inside scream like <gasps> And when it hit the floor, my nephew who was sleeping beneath, he thought that it was the second coming of the Lord. <laughs> He said to me later, that was the worst wake-up call of my life. And when he saw me shaking, my whole body was shaking because I know half of my life is there. And I was, I don't know what to do. So I opened my laptop and my nephew does not know what to do as well. So he just walked back and forth. And I opened my laptop and I switched on the button. It was blank. It was black and I said, Lord, I have some clients that I need to, I need to deliver. And what can I do right now? I remember to pray. So I prayed, Lord, please. And I begged God and I used the word, Lord, please heal my laptop. <laughs> heal is, is much more biblical. <laughs> so, so I came to the Lord and I said, Lord, please heal my laptop. You've healed sick people in your time. You even raised people from the dead. And I even bring to him verses that I did not even thought that I memorized. I said, Lord, with you nothing is impossible. So I, I coached God on what to do with my laptop. <laughs> and then I realized the Lord reminded me of this, of this commitment that I had a few months before that. In the youth conference, I surrendered everything to the Lord. And the Lord reminded me, have you surrendered? You have surrendered everything to me, haven't you? And I said, yes, Lord, but this is my... Okay. Everything means everything. And I said, okay, Lord, this laptop is yours. Whatever your choice with this laptop. If you choose to fix it, if you choose to heal it, then I'll praise your name. If you choose not to heal it, then I still praise your name because my life is in your hands now. And I was still praying, and then I heard this sound. <laughs> when I opened my eyes, I saw my laptop put up. And I said, praise the Lord! And praise the Lord indeed. <laughs> and then I told God, Lord, wherever I go, I will bring this testimony. I will tell people how amazing you are. And God has been doing it. And I remember one time that I was preaching. I've been going back and forth to Malaysia with that, with that testimony. And then I, I preach in this church. This church is like 800 attendees. And people were so blessed. And then later on when I went back to my room, I said to the Lord, Okay, Lord, until when will you allow this laptop to boot up? And then when I switch on the laptop, it's dead. And then I said, Lord, please forgive me of my unbelief. After that prayer, <laughs> the laptop went back to life. And then it hit me. It's not God that's, it's not God that's limited. It's us that's limited. Our unbelief limits Him. Our unbelief limits Him. Sometimes we forget how big our God is. Sometimes we forget how amazing our God is. Amen? Amen. And I, I remember this beautiful quote here from, from Prophets and Kings. This, this happened when, when, I, when I realized 
how the Lord supplies our needs. When the Lord gives a work to be done, let not man stop to inquire into the reasonableness of the command or the probable result of their efforts to obey. The supply in their hands may seem to fall short of the need to be filled, but in the hands of the Lord, it will prove more than sufficient. Amen? Amen. I remember that when my laptop came back to life, the only way, the only way, uh, the only responsible way to do is to back up my files. So I bought a, a hard drive with the money that I don't have. I, I withdraw that money. It was my client's money for, for his wedding album, and I brought a hard drive. And I'm thinking, Lord, I don't know how to pay this back, but I have to have a backup right now. So I bought that, uh, I bought that hard drive, and I surrendered it to the Lord. And then one particular time, while we were having Bible studies with, uh, with one of, of the locals there in, in Malaysia, there was this one doctor. She is Singaporean, and, and she is uh, Hindu. And she is beginning to learn about God. And she approached me with this question, Jem, tell me, what do you need? Remember, my deal with God is not to tell people about my need and not to ask and not to borrow. And then, you know what? I think I was tempted. If I remembered what I need, I was tempted to tell her. But the Lord blocked me out. I could not remember what I need. And I told her, honestly speaking, I don't know what I need. And she told me, no, no, no. The Lord compelled me to ask you, what do you need? I said, I could not remember what I need. She said, no, the Lord does not make mistakes, Jem. Whenever, whenever the Lord prompts me to ask a person what that person needs, he needed something. I'll give you a, an example. Just last week, a Filipina employee in our, in our office just came from the Philippines, and somehow the Lord compelled me to ask that person what her need is. And that Filipina was, was quite shy. And I know you Filipinos are quite shy. She did not know that I'm not shy. <laughs> I'm quite shameless. <laughs> so she, she came to me and said, no, that Filipina, she was a bit shy, and later on she, she, gave, me, she gave me the real answer. Now this is what happened. I asked her what she needs, and, and she said, no, I'm okay. No, no, you're not okay. The Holy Spirit convicted me to tell you, to ask you, what do you need? And that Filipina said, I need a mattress. I don't have a mattress in my apartment. I said, okay, I have an extra mattress. I'll give that to you. But that's not the need that the Lord is asking me to ask you. And then the... The Filipina began to cry. He said, I need a fridge. She needed a re refrigerator. And I said, okay, I could give one, but that's still not the need. And the woman began to cry even more. And then she said, I need a car. <laughs> and then the doctor said, now that is the need that the Lord is asking me to fill in. And I was tempted to say that time as well, I need a car too. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how to drive, so <laughs> I really don't need a car. Even until that time, I could not remember what I needed. And then she told me, okay, since you're not telling me what your needs are, this is what I'll do. For the next 12 months, Every time that the Lord compels me to give you something, I will send it to you. I will actually, I'll actually pledge it. I'll give you $100 per month. But if the Lord compels me to give me more, I'll send it to you. And that particular time, she gave me $100. And then later on, when I received that, I thanked her and I thanked God. When I received the $100, and then I begin to realize, oh, I needed $100 to buy a hard drive. Actually, just $80, so there's still $10 for the tithes. Amen? Amen? God is so good. And this is one thing that, that I begin to realize. Lord, you are so much more than any need that we have. But we always put you in a box. We always put you in a little box. Not just a huge box, but a little box. And then this one particular illustration, I don't know if you know about 
about this illustration, but this really inspired me. Have you seen a video entitled, How Big Is Our God? Who among you has seen that video? Louis Giglio. Louis Giglio. Yes. It's so powerful. That gives you a perspective, isn't it? A perspective how, how big your God is. And, and he, he explained about the measurement of the distance in, in the galaxies, in, in the universe. You don't use the miles there. You don't use the kilometer. You use the, the measurement called what? Light years. And light years is the distance that the light travels in, in a year. And the speed of light is how many miles per second? 180. Wow, there's a lot of intelligent people in this room. All the while, I thought that I'll be the, the intelligent one here because I have the copy. 186,000 miles per second. Just imagine that so fast. And the distance that the light travels in a year is called the light year. And it's 5.88 trillion miles. Just imagine that. It's huge. And our galaxy is called what galaxy? The Milky Way. Not the chocolate, but the galaxy. The Milky Way. And Milky Way is composed of like more than 100 billion stars. A hundred billion stars. And he pointed out another galaxy which is called the Whirlpool. And it's not the fridge or the air conditioning unit. Whirlpool galaxy is, well, you know what's the distance of Whirlpool galaxy from, from Milky Way? From the edge to edge? Can anyone guess? It's 31 million light years away. 31 million light years away. And one light year is what? 5.88 trillion miles. When I was trying to make sense of those numbers, and I'm thinking, oh Lord, my nose will bleed here. <laughs> That's too much zeros. That's too much. 31 million light years away, just reaching the edge of Whirlpool Galaxy. And Whirlpool Galaxy has more or less 300 billion stars in it. And he talked about just the stars, the first star that is nearest our galaxy, which is the what? The sun. And the sun, you know how much big, uh, how big is the sun compared to the earth? He said, if we have like 15 meters in diameter, size of a sun, so like from this wall, no, not 15 meters, 15 feet. It says, I guess, 15 feet, huh? Approximately, if the sun is like this big, the earth would be like a golf ball. If the earth is a golf ball, the sun would be like 15 meters in diameter. And the sun is 960,000 times bigger than the earth. It's huge, isn't it? All the while, I thought it's like 100 times bigger, 1,000 times bigger, but it's nearly a million times bigger than the earth. And then the next, the next star that he mentioned was Betelgeuse. He said, the moment he knows the size, he discovered the size of Betelgeuse, it's like two months that he does not know how to pray. Because before his prayers were like instructing God, giving counsel to God, correcting God. And when he knew the size of Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse is twice the size, not twice the size of the sun, but twice the size of the orbit of the earth around the sun. Did you get that? Twice the size of the orbit of the earth around the sun. My dear friends, who among you here has, who among you here has gone to, to New York and has have seen the Empire State Building? Okay, it's amazing, isn't it? So you go to New York, to Fifth Avenue and then put the, the golf ball on the road and look up to the Empire State Building and imagine five more Empire State Buildings stacked to one another. That's how big Betelgeuse is and that's how big the Earth is. Betelgeuse is 262 trillion times bigger than the Earth. 
The next star that he mentioned was Musifi. Musifi, he said, if you go to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, well, among you has gone to San Francisco. Beautiful spot, isn't it? You put, you put the golf ball at the beginning of the bridge and then imagine another Golden Gate Bridge. Golden Gate Bridge is like nearly two kilometers, isn't it? And that's how big Musif is, and that's how small the earth is. And it says here, Musifi is 2.7 quadrillion times bigger than the earth. Okay, now I know you have internal bleeding right now. <laughs> There's a lot of zeros there. One million seconds ago, I like this illustration. One million seconds ago is 12 days ago. One billion seconds ago is 33 years ago. One trillion seconds ago, can you guess when is this? What was that era? Hmm? Seventeen hundreds? The Reformation? <laughs> it's 29,700 BC. That's one trillion seconds ago. I did not realize that's how big a trillion is. And one quadrillion seconds ago, don't even guess, just give up. <laughs> it's 30,800,000 BC. That's one quadrillion seconds ago. And Musifi is 2.7 quadrillion times bigger than the earth. And the biggest one was Canis Majoris. Canis Majoris, if the earth was a golf ball, Canis Majoris is the size of Mount Everest. If you put this little golf ball there at the foot of Mount Everest and look up, that's how big Canis Majoris is. Canis Majoris, my dear friends, is seven quadrillion times bigger than the earth. Seven. We're not just talking about one, but seven quadrillion times bigger than the earth. Friends, the moment I realized this, wow, God is not talking about galaxies here. It's just talking about stars. And just Canus Majoris alone already blew our minds. And I'm thinking, let me remind you, how did the Lord made all those things again? No, not made, created. Didn't he speak into existence? <laughs> he just spoke. He just spoke, my dear friends, and all these things came into existence. Amen. Amen? And most of the time we doubt his word. We doubt his promises. We try to rely more on what other people will say than what the Lord says. We spend more time listening to what other people say and than listen to what he says. And we spend more time reading fictional materials than reading this. And this is the reason why there's lives. It's the reason why there's not much miracle happening in our ministries, in our church. We don't take the word of the Lord so seriously. We don't take him so seriously. I remember one time, another person shared a message like this, and he gave an update about the Hubble telescope. The Hubble telescope was just newly calibrated, and they focus on this one corn-sized spot, Brother Jed, corn-sized spot, and they let the Hubble telescope, I forgot the number of days that they stuck the Hubble telescope on that spot, like 26 days or, or more, 26 days, and the Hubble telescope just went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in that block, mass blackness in the universe, and said, they want to know what is in that, in that little, in the little spot there. And after 26 days, 
the results came out. And they discovered in that corn size spot that they have seen 10,000, not stars, but galaxies. 10,000 galaxies in that little space there. And we begin to realize, friends, the universe is bigger than we ever imagined. Just imagine the God who made that universe. No, He did not make created. <laughs> he made something out of nothing. He just spoke and all these worlds came into existence. And how dare we doubt His words? How dare we doubt His words? And then while I was reading one time, while I was in my devotions, I read this beautiful, beautiful quote here. Beautiful verse, Luke 17, Luke 12, verse 17, I mean. And I'll just read the first line of this verse. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Even the what? The, hairs. the very hairs of your head are all numbered. You know what hit me during the time? Wow, the Lord knows about my falling hair. Did you get this? Am I right? The Lord knows about our falling hair. Every time the wind blows, there goes two. When you comb your hair, especially when you're in a rush, there goes 15. When you're playing with your kids or your nephew, and then there goes 35. God takes notice of the things you don't even care about. He knows even the numbers of your head. He, gave, he pays so much attention to your life. Does that compel us to pay much attention to Him? We are so consumed of a lot of things in this world that we are not consumed by Him. We have to ask ourselves, what consumes us? Uh, when you are at work, what are the things that you cannot wait to do until you get back home. That is the thing that consumes you. Even when you're sitting right now, what is the thing that's bothering you that you need to do back home? That is the thing that consumes you. Is God the one consuming us? That is the question. If God is the one that consumes us, then He will sustain us. Amen? Amen. I come up with this, with this conclusion. Whatever it is that consumes us could either sustain us or exhaust us. If we are consumed by this world, we will be exhausted, my dear friends. But if we are consumed by God, we will be sustained. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope and I pray that this week, starting this week, that only God will consume us. Amen? Let me remind you again of how big your God is. <laughs> whenever you're faced with a trial, whenever you're faced with a difficulty, whenever you're faced with something that you think is more important than Him, look up. Look at the stars. He just spoke, and all those things came into existence. He just spoke, and all those things came into existence. And never ever forget the fact as well that He knows the very things that you don't even care about in your life. He knows the very detail of your life. He pays so much attention to you. And I hope this week we'll pay much attention to Him because He has more for us. He is waiting to, to bestow more, but we have to pay more attention. Amen.